I am Scott Homan, volunteering this week for Decult Cult Awareness Conference in New Zealand. And today we have a very special guest, Dr. Caroline Ansley from Christ Church. She's going to discuss Centerpoint Restoration Project, the Cult Chat podcast, her status as a medical doctor and her unique perspective on cults, as well as the fact that she's speaking at Decult, the Cult Awareness Conference. How are you doing, doing today? Very well. Thank you, Scott. Nice to be here. Thanks for coming on. Could you give us a brief introduction to your background and activism? I uh, grew up when I was a child down the road from a, a group that wasn't at the time notorious, though it was a controversial, center point community. Um, and my family had a close association with the community. I ended up living there um, during a period of time when my family broke apart. So I was a child of this community for a time, and I experienced some of the worst harms that kids experienced when they were there. Later on, this group, Centre Point community, uh, it became really clear that they were causing harm to children. There were um, drugs being manufactured there, um, a lot of sexual abuse of kids. Wow. There were court court trials, there were police raids, and they were all over the news uh, in New Zealand for many years, actually, on and off over time. And eventually, through the work of some very committed ex-members and some of their adult children, uh, they managed to close the community down in 2000. So it operated for 20 years. So that was my my uh, uh, experience and in, in, a, in a really notorious cult in New Zealand. Um, in terms of my activism, well, uh, a lot, a lot happened. A lot of not, nothing happened actually for me for a number of years. I, I kind of grew up and uh, became a doctor and um, talked a bit about what happened to me because I was harmed while I was there. But I didn't really kind of think of it as anything other than a bad experience, um, and I didn't really start to join the dots until. Um, I mean, I'd seen stuff on the news and the media about Centrepoint, and I'd heard about um, some of my contemporaries who were also children at Centrepoint um, taking people to uh, court and getting convictions for child sexual abuse um, and drug um, oh. crimes. But in terms of how it affected me, I was very re removed from it until um, oh, about 10 years ago when uh, my path collided with Anka Richter's path and Anka is a real mover and shaker in the cult awareness space in New Zealand and is is the person behind the cult which is why we're here yeah. Um, yeah. but I met Anka through her work which um, was a uh, an article in a North and South magazine that I happened to read while I was at work one day and for, for Anka that um, that article was a real disappointment because she was actually trying to write a book about Centrepoint. So she often talks about it as being uh, the baby that, that, that she terminated or was aborted. Um, the article. A real dis yes. Well, no, the yeah. book. The book. Okay. And, but out of that came this article that mm. really was the first time I'd seen someone go, what, is the, what was the aftermath? What happened to the children? You know, it's 20 years now or nearly 20 years. What, what, what's it been like for the kids and, and what are their lives like growing up. So it was the first time I'd considered that for not just myself, but my contemporaries. And um, that article set me on a path of examining my own story and trying to fit it into the history, uh, looking at other of my contemporaries, meeting them, finding out what life was like for them, trying to form relationships and seeing a huge gap in the justice space, in the ability to tell their own stories um, uh, with a sense of dignity without it um, getting lost in shame and a, a real uh, disagreement about the facts um, and a, a lot of people feeling quite alone, quite a lot of dysfunction. So these were my contemporaries and, and that as a doctor, so now I was a GP, by the way, you know, I was, I guess, accustomed to hearing people's pain and doing something about it. So that's that's my training as a doctor. You know, I don't just hear people's pain and do nothing. Um, so it, that prompted me to 
kind of notice that there was nothing out there other than these media pieces that popped up every so often. There was nothing out there for the children that was sort of a, a permanent record. And um, so I started a website called the Centre Point Restoration Project. And the point of that was, first of all, a project. Though I didn't expect it to last forever. I was hoping there'd be a beginning, middle and an end. <laughs> um, Centre Point was, you know, obvious. Um, restoration was about this idea of repair, of making right, of, of somehow fixing things. And I think a lot of people don't really understand what I meant by restoration. But I thought of it as like, you know, restoring an old car, you know, something that is, is, isn't that good now, coming along and, and making it better somehow. And that, that wasn't about covering over or, or, or um, minimising the harms that had happened to the children, but it was about giving the children some agency to take their own history and instead of running away from it or shutting it down or having someone else telling them it wasn't real, was actually owning it and going, well, what am I, this is my, this is my um, heritage, unfortunately. I've got this history of living in this place that caused me a lot of harm and all the complexity around it, and I want to make that right. So, yeah, so that was an invitation to um, the children in the community and also the adults in the community to, to go, well, guys, you didn't do well enough here. You know, you said you were a community that was filled with love and that you were growing all these children into a, you know, a different way of being and that you love them. But 20 years on, you haven't actually done anything in a kind of corporate um, corporate way that acknowledges the harm that happened. And so it was a... Are you talking about society in general? The adults who lived there, oh. um, who were many of whom were the parents mm. or step-parents or friends of, of these now adult um, former children of the community. Yeah. So, yeah, that was where I started. And... Um, uh, so the, the website was a blog, it was an archive, it was a, 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 a touch point for people. And um, yeah, so that kind of tricked along for a while. And then, um, oh yeah, there's one, there's one of my blogs. Yeah, that was about the abuse and care inquiry that was asking um, Centre Point kids to consider putting their own experiences forward to the Royal, uh, Royal Inquiry of Abuse in State Care and... Which yeah. is recent, right? That's is, uh, yeah, that's, that's just that, happening that was, now. That's, yeah, that's happening now. So, yeah, so I've been blogging about stuff related to Centre Point Kids for 10 years or so. Okay. Um, and I've been involved in other things, like um, I, I pulled together a group of people to talk, to talk about um, their experiences as sort of a support group. Um, that was one thing. And another thing was in May 21, um, I participated in a documentary about the history of the community, which um, there were two other child survivors of the community who were imp involved in that. And I think about five or six former adults of the community also were in that. Yep, that's it. Heaven and Hell, the Centre Point story. So that was produced, um, was funded by New Zealand On Air, done by Warner Brothers um, New Zealand, and the director was Natalie Malkin. Um, and... That was a powerful thing to be part of. It um, produced a lot of anxiety amongst former children of Centre Point because they'd, many of them had been accustomed to having this um, oh, real triggering experience through exposés in the media. And I believe this was different because it was truly um, trauma-informed, I believe, and very survivor-focused. It's very compassionate to the needs of the, the former children, um, and it asked some big questions about uh, making right and repair. Uh, yeah, so I think it was different, and I was pleased to be part of it. And one thing that came out of it was um, in the lead-up to the the airing in May 21, um, myself, Kate and Rachel, who are uh, in that picture there that you've got on the screen, where yeah. the three survivors that were in the documentary, we penned a open letter to the to the adults of the community, who were the ones we were asking to make it right, and it's on my website, uh, Centre Point Restoration Project, and it was published in the, uh, in, the, in the Canvas magazine on the um, the New, uh, New Zealand Herald, I think, um, that open letter. So it was a kind of a this is what happened to us. This is what our experience was. Uh, and this is how that experience impact many of us. And we deserve that to be recognised and to be uh, 
some accountability and some acknowledgement. Um, yeah, so that caused a little bit of a stir, and I think it was quite meaningful. So you have to find the tab, take action, go to the take action, take action. tab. Yeah, there, yeah. and the open letter is the top one. Yeah. Um, that, that I think was quite a significant um, thing. It was a sort of a, I, can, I think of it like a, a line in the sand, really. It's mm. because there'd been so much obfuscation from the former adults of the community who didn't really want to own what had happened or consider its impact on the children. This sort of statement was something that kind of went, no, this is what it was like, actually. And this number of former children of the community and some of their support people have signed it. And um, yeah, Publicly. It's really powerful, yeah. actually, to see their yeah. name and their time they're in. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. And, um, yeah, so that in itself was a, a meaningful uh action from the global perspective we might think okay new zealand's an island nation far far away of course there's a, there's some bizarre little community why should anybody care but in a really special way because it's a small community that's kind of a closed system well people that leave are now part of general society and then the general society is interacting with them so there's work to be done because they're not just getting lost in in my in the united states where i'm based people that go through this kind of experience tend to fall into, well, maybe they fall into a government program or a church community or another cult or drugs and, and then are lost on the street, but they kind of disperse into society and no one has to really think about it because the population is so gigantic and there's kind of infinite places they could get lost into. But if you have a small area where it's like, Oh yeah, that person came out of the forest from Gloria Vale and they ended up in my neighborhood and now they're here, we have to, we're gonna talk about it. It's a really interesting kind of case study on what can happen or what, what, what kind of work needs to be done post cult experience. Cause there's this stigma, I think you mentioned in other podcast media things you've done where we just talk, the media always talks about someone's in a cult. Okay, they got out, they're free, great, story's over. End of roll credits. But there's this whole process that happens, and even you mentioned that it was decades or like many years later, where you're like, "Oh, I should need yeah, to think well, about that thing." I can I can absolutely speak to that, and um, I haven't heard many people talk about this this whole idea of the fallout, the recovery, the yeah. um, I've, so I feel like I'm in a somewhat unique perspe- uh, pos- position, not only because of the fact that these events happened so long ago and the cult closed and everyone moved on, we moved on, <laughs> inverted commas. Um, but the fact that I've spent 10 years struggling with both the people who were harmed, the children largely, so those many adults were harmed as well, and the adults or the people who, were har- who caused the harm. Um, I've been working to try to kind of get some closure some acknowledgement for 10 years and I have to say I haven't got very far um, which has been disappointing but it's also been enlightening it's like this stuff gets just pushed into a corner and utterly entrenched in that corner and the vulnerable people they don't get an opportunity to um, to heal to uh, 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 put the shame where it actually belongs to uh, to truly move on without this um, deep hurt popping up constantly in their lives and turning them upside down. Uh, yeah. One thing that was shocking to me, and I, I'm, I directed a documentary about the project of people leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's from the perspective of artists, artists escaping cults, witness underground. Um, so plug. But, and this is where you're going to probably see this video. So if you haven't seen that movie, go watch it. But the big thing for me that was frustrating and that kept on coming back up was I was associated with a cult group and that there's a stigma to all my friends who were never a part of that thing that, oh, Scott's a part of that thing, right? And I was like struggling with my own identity while it was happening in real time. Like I have these friends, I had a lot of friends outside. So that's an atypical situation, but I had like a dual faith upbringing, if you will. But I wasn't adopting all the beliefs, but I had the stigma and I lived with that. It was like an in-group, out-group dynamic and internal thing happening. But then getting out, it's like I was so happy and proud to be not a part of that thing 
and then to work on doing the life I wanted to have and find, you know, kind of explore who I am and my identity. But everyone who ever learned anything about my past was like, oh, Scott used to be part of a cult, like a, an othering throughout my whole life. And then I get out and it's like, oh, it's still a thing we can otherize. And, and you're, you're a unique case. And it's like, you got to meet my friend, Scott. He grew up in a cult. And it's like, okay, first of all, that's my perspective. And I don't like the framing, but there's this thing that I think society does in general. And I feel like you're kind of, you're touching on that with your experience and the people that you've met who also have gotten out of center point. Um, and probably many other groups. Yeah, they don't want to talk about it at all. You know, the children yeah. just want to get on with their lives because many of them actually don't identify with a lot of harm either. They don't feel like they were harmed. They felt like they had a good childhood um, because maybe they were fortunate enough to grow up at Centre Point after the majority of the harm happened and after the criminal mm-hmm. trials and where things did change. Um, and, and maybe they were more protected. Um, some of them. So not everyone has the same kind of experience. So you're right, there's a huge societal stigma. And that in itself is a double punishment, almost. I even know some people for whom, you know, they were absolutely the victims. They come out of the group, they grow up, and then they get um, treated as if they're perpetrators because of this connection Mm. to the group. But they were the victims. There's no evidence at all that they were perpetrators of harm Mm. nothing there's no evidence yet that's how they get treated through Mm. societal stigma and that's because people learned about that group and they're like anyone who's associated must be negatively associated exactly like you know the glory of our woman walking through the streets of gray mouth and being spat at it's like i'm sorry but they're the victims you know Mm. so that's the problem is is that if society learns something but in a in a unsubtle or not very nuanced way they just do more othering and it's like eh, yeah not not good enough what i found is that anytime i try to tell someone about my past is the general population of humans has about a one to three minute window of time where they're willing to listen to someone else's story i think there's a mm-hmm. human storytelling problem and why it's so important to write books humanizing yes. the experience and to mm-hmm. make movies or to do like your podcast which i brought up on the screen here the cult chat podcast to to disseminate this knowledge in a way that people can start to understand those differences. Exactly. Could you talk a little does... bit about what's going on with Cult Chat? Well, Cult Chat Sorry. was um, – I, I during the pandemic, I attended the International Cultic Studies Association Conference, which is a one, once-a-year event. It's kind of the only conference – so far that happens in the the cult space yeah and I attended it online because it was a pandemic and Mm. that was 2022 I guess it was 2022 that was when the (laughs) pandemic was the first time I sort of really suddenly got hit by the fact that nothing I experienced at centre point was unique then nothing about Mm. it was unique I mean that's not quite true there were unique things but there were lots of same same Ah, same, same. You know, that group, that group, In that all group, the other groups. Group. Yes. Religious and groups, just, political yes, cults, yes, religious cults. Yes, yes, yes. It was the first time my eye, my brain really went, oh. It's bigger. My God. Yes. It's and a human, yes. human nature problem or narcissistic yep. abuse yep. problem. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. And, and just joining the dots all of a sudden, and I just, I guess I realized that you could only go so far asking a group of people to make right. There's only so... Many times you can say that. Only so many different ways you can say that. I mean, you know, if people are going to get on board, they're going to get on board or they're not. So it made me kind of realize, well, I kind of needed to either stop, (laughs) go back to doing more of medical work and spending less time on this stuff, or I needed to go wide. So that's when cult chat came up. And I was already having conversations with um, Liz and Lindy who are, advocates in their own space um in and they're this your area. co-hosts right yeah yeah liz um uh, is the manager and the um the, the person who started the founder of the glory of our labor levers support trust and she's had a huge role in bringing people out of that really um isolated cult group in new zealand and uh lindy jacob is um a former exclusive brethren and she um has been doing work for years to try to support leavers and she um, founded the olive leaf network last year or at least it went live last year um, which is a group a support service for people um, 
coming out of those groups. So yeah, Cult yeah. Chat um, launched and we've we're up to oh now thirty three, I think thirty three episodes. Do a fortnightly talk about issues that um, are all across the cultiverse in New Zealand specifically. It's all about uh, drawing attention of um, to New Zealanders, to policy makers, to frontline health workers, to survivors, that, you know, like that aha moment that I had when I was listening to the uh, International Cultic Studies Association conference that, oh my God, this is this is universal stuff. Um, and also addressing that issue that I keep on, that question I keep on hearing over and over again from people. New Zealand, New Zealand doesn't have a cult problem, does it? You know, people keep on asking me that and I'm like, well, let me tell you. <laughs> So I guess we're trying to build an archive of content that's entirely focused on the New Zealand um, context and also unpack yeah. some stuff. Um, I think we're uniquely placed, the three of us as individuals, to not just be talking heads. Like We've actually got personal experience. We've got skin in the game. We know people. We've had personal experiences. We know our shit, basically. And um, I think together as a collaboration of three, I'd like to think we're quite powerful. Yeah. New Zealand may be ahead of a lot of the world in this topic, partially because you are facing the problem and, and care about the topic of what's happening after. I have a few logos up here with your Centerpoint Restoration Project, Decult Conference website with all of Leaf Network, Gloriaville Leavers. Mm. People need to be doing something about this. It's not just, oh, they're free now. Great. We solved the problem. Yeah, yeah. And now that person's totally healthy and has a totally normal life. Yeah, like, yeah, no, there's exactly. a, we need to give people a soft landing in the real world because it's not also a perfect place. And it's another worldview. And who do you trust? There's a lot of, yeah, a lot yeah. of issues. Maybe you can speak to some of that. Yeah. Well, uh, cult, the whole point of cult chat is to try to increase awareness and education so people have somewhere to, to start rather than just we don't have a problem with this in New Zealand or why didn't you leave? You know, those yeah, two responses right. are so, bleh, you know, like they're just so kind of like derogatory and empty and ignorant. And, and, ignorant. and I think, um, I guess that leads to my position as a doctor, is that right now, uh, and this is changing, but right now I think doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners and radiographers and all the, Ambulance officers, all those people that you might expect to meet in a health consultation, I think they're no more educated than Joe Public. And mm, they wow. bring their stigma and bias and prejudice to those moments of interaction, just in the same way that you have just already described as being othered. So too do um, the people that you actually reasonably should expect to be treated with compassion. Um, and there's a complete lack of awareness. Like it's, it's, we're still stuck in this whole, it's okay to laugh at people who've come out of cults thing. And I just think, I just think that's unacceptable from the health workforce. Absolutely, yeah. utterly unacceptable. So my goal is that that will change. And I think it's fundamentally important for a number of reasons. One, when you're in a closed group where the outside world is not trustworthy, where anyone with any expertise or knowledge or education is um, vilified or avoided. Health workers are definitely going to be avoided, for one thing. But they sometimes have to go to the doctor. Um, like they may have a complicated birth. They may break an arm. They may have a severe episode of asthma. You know, um, they may have um, sepsis and end up in hospital. These are the moments where a caring, compassionate, understanding, non-prejudiced health worker can say to a person in a cult, actually, there's love out, outside in the world. There's kindness outside in the world. And it's a, just a little seed. It, it sows a seed of maybe, maybe there might be someone safe out there um, to counter that inside-outsider, this is the best place to be, the outside world's dangerous and and no one is kind out there. You know, it counters that. And there's not many other professional, it depends on the, the group, of course, how closed they are, because not they're not all closed in the same same degree. 
But, you know, it just sort of, it's just an opportunity to, to see love in action. And that's ultimately what health workers do. I mean, I was in hospital last week briefly and this nurse was just really nice to me. <laughs> It's so kind. It's just like, well, that's their job and that's why they're there. You've kind of isolated the problem that there's not a good education in the healthcare workspace, but what can the average person who's listening to this do? And then what, why isn't decult important? Well, um, I think compassion and understanding is critical because I think right now, and I've said this before, New Zealand is like, like a country – uh, with no measles program. You know, if measles comes into New Zealand, you've got no measles vaccination program. Everyone gets measles, right? So uh, right now, New Zealand has got a very low vaccination rate against cults. Very, very low. Hardly anyone's had the cult vaccine to stop them from catching a cult. And information is the vaccine. We need to inoculate our country against cults. So that when cults come knocking on your door, you go, mm, nah, I can recognize that's not okay. That stuff that you're selling me is not what it appears to be. So I won't, I won't catch it. Thank you. Um, and so I think information and awareness is critical. So that's part of what we're doing. And that's a huge part of decult is about increasing awareness. And the other bit is about kindness and c compassion. And that's what every New Zealander can do is once you know and understand, you can be kind and you can be compassionate and you can be that soft landing point for a person coming out of a group because so often you don't leave because you've got no one to leave to. The people are more successful at leaving are the people who have some kind of relationship already formed in the outside world, someone that they can trust and, and they find more people they can trust. So you can be that kind person. Um, again, to cult is doing that too. The conference is, is sort of sharing stories, helping people to kind of feel something for the situation. And um, I mean, I think ultimately people who have been in cults are like refugees in a new world. And, you know, we need to understand, to care for refugees, we need to understand their situation. We need to understand where they've come from. We need to understand what they need. We need to get alongside them so they don't end up utterly failing and their children utterly fail. I love that concept of a, a religious refugee or a worldview cult refugee, however you want to label that. As a, it's a new concept for me and I really think it, it describes the severity of what the person probably went through and what they're still going through. It's not just a past thing. It's a consistent, it's a regular thing that is constantly a part of your day if you leave something like exactly, this. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and as a doctor, you know, like refugees have particular health needs. Um, they have uh, health neglect, things that didn't get, didn't preventative care that never happened, um, treatment of chronic illness that never happened. So that's something I'd like to, you know, more knowledge around um, for doctors and healthcare workers that there's actually some targeted health needs that must be addressed because they weren't. And that's what I'll be talking about at Decult. Excellent. That is a great introduction to who you are and how important Decult is. Thank you for coming on to the Witness Underground podcast to discuss that and for being a part of Decult and helping Anka with the project. I noticed when we were just showing the ICSA website, are you going to be participating in that? Yeah, yeah. Me and yeah. Anka and Liz are doing a wee talk, 90 minutes. It's quite long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going, we're going to the um, Barcelona conference and we're speaking. That's really exciting. Makes me want to move to Barcelona. <laughs> that they actually <laughs> create this. In, could you describe the difference between maybe ICSA and other cult type conferences and decult? I haven't actually been yet. Like I've only oh, done okay. the online one, but um, uh, it's a it's a, a group of many of them are academics researchers. Um, there's also former uh, the survivors and um, survivor activists. So it's kind of like a bit of a community. And this is their yearly um, conference where people come together. They seem to, I, I haven't, like I said, I haven't gone, but I get the impression that people are pretty connected as they work in this area together to increase awareness and bring research. And I think form, primarily the goal was to get research and some actual scientific evidence that ultimately uh, change and money funding comes from research or it can come from research so without research it's pretty hard to change stuff so I think that's their primary drive so at the conference I'm expecting to hear a lot of research 
And some of the same people are going to be in New Zealand at Decult. Yes, yes. And how that compares to Decult? Well, there's not the there's not the research angle for one thing at Decult because we're we're brand new and and there is there is no research in New Zealand. There's there might be some people doing master's projects and things like that, but there's only really been one piece of research that was specifically targeted um, on the cult issue, and that was in 2010, and that was about center point children and what it was like and later in life for them. But we have a real lack of um, interest and funding and motivation to do research in New Zealand on this topic. But I'm hoping that will change, you know, as more people come into the space and they look around and they go, oh, I see the problem, which is currently invisible to most people. Once the problem becomes visible, then people start to find ways to quantify the problem, describe the problem. Like, I'd love some prevalence data you know how many people are in cults in New Zealand like that's just a simple simple well not Mm. simple to find but a simple question we don't have that content so how can you how can you do something as a sort of social health um, government workforce if you don't have prevalence data just the the basic stuff one last thing before we wrap up thank you for sharing all that Decult is also partnered with a documentary group who's currently crowdfunding so we'll have this live during the crowdfund campaign right now it's 12 days but when you hear this it'll probably be less and they're not quite funded yet but they're going to be capturing the best of the conference and packaging powerful moments from the conference into a documentary so if you're if you're interested in this topic there's a few ways to join you can show up in person fly to Christ Christchurch if you're in New Zealand drive go somehow get there and attend in person buy a ticket the other way is there's going to be a live stream that you can also buy a ticket for And this isn't a for-profit organization. This is a group that's trying to disseminate knowledge in a powerful and professional way. And hoping to cover their costs. From making a documentary, they're trying to raise um, a a low-end goal, a minimum goal of $7,000. And Mm. documentaries cost a lot more than that. Just in Mm. costs, most people that do it, do it out of their heart. And they Mm. believe in the topic and want to tell a story that's important. Um, so again, this is just covering the costs. In this space, certainly in New Zealand, um, everyone that I know is not making money. They're, they're um, forgoing money to send this message out. So there's a huge, huge number of big hearts um, yeah. because it's a story that matters to most of us. Thank you so much for sharing and for putting the work in and for inviting people in to help. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to meet you in person and good luck at the conference in Barcelona in the meantime. Thank you. Lovely to talk, Scott. Thanks, Caroline.